guys, welcome back to my channel. If you're new here, hi, my name is Caitlin Elliott and I cover vintage cases on Fridays with my more current cases on Tuesdays. And I hope you all are having a wonderful, wonderful Friday. I hope everything's going well for you guys. And so every Friday I record vintage cases for my, uh, my series that I have called Crimes Through the Times. And in my last video for True Crime Tuesday, we talked about Polly Class, and today I'm going to be talking about the solved case of Brenda Sue Brown. Brenda Sue Brown was born on May 15th of 1955 in Stanford, North Carolina. She lived there with her mother named Gladys Brown, and she had her two younger sisters named Patricia and Mary. But uh, Brenda Sue was described by her friends and family as a very shy and quiet girl and she really loved life and going to school where she had quite a lot of friends there and a lot of people really cared about her. At the time of Brenda Sue's abduction, she was 11 years old and had just recently finished the fifth grade. On July 27th of 1966, Brenda Sue and her younger sisters woke up early that morning because she was supposed to take her sisters to a Head Start class that day. For those who aren't aware, Head, a Head Start program is a special organization that provides early childhood education, health, nutrition, and even parent involvement classes for uh, that are catered towards low-income children and low-income families. That morning, Brenda Sue and Patricia were actually seen arguing over a compact mirror case. And this, it was unsure at the time of what exactly started this argument and what had been behind it. This was said to have been the very last time that Brenda Sue Brown was ever seen alive. At 10.15 a.m. that morning, her mother named Gladys became extremely concerned when Brenda Sue had not arrived home from taking her sisters to the Head Start program. So she began driving around the local community in the local neighborhood, just asking everyone that she could, everyone that she saw, whether or not they had seen Brenda Sue. And nobody had claimed to have seen the 11-year-old girl. After an hour later, a search party was constructed in the local community of Shelby, North Carolina. And this was actually the same town that I had talked about previously whenever I had covered a case about Asia Degree. And I will link that down below in the description box because I think it's kind of interesting that it both takes place in the same um, city, in the same town. It's so bizarre. So at 6.45, that exact same evening that Brenda Sue went missing, the lifeless body and nude body of Brenda Sue would soon be discovered. She was found in a wooded area only 100 feet away from South Lafayette Street, which was not that far away from her home. Her body had been covered up with tree limbs, leaves, bush, and bushes as if trying to cover up what they had done. The red dress that she had last been seen in was actually folded up neatly next to her, which I found so odd. Like, why kill someone, take off their clothes, and just fold it up all nice and neat next to her? Like, it's just so weird. And right next to her body and her clothes that were folded up nice and neat was a bloodied rock. Authorities arrived at the scene of the crime and they observed her body, noticing that there was the bloody rock right next to her. And the, uh, the detectives, they established that Brenda Sue had actually been beaten with the bloody rock so severely that her skull had actually been fractured into 12 pieces. You'd have to hit, in order for that to happen, you'd have to hit someone so hard with such violence and force in order for that to happen. And it's just so weird. So as police, they looked into her nude body. She, they realized that she had not been abused in any way. Police theorized that Brenda Sue's killer was actually on foot because South Lafayette Street had a lot of heavy traffic that day. So they must have fled out of there by walking so they wouldn't been able to get out of his car to abduct Brenda and take her somewhere because there would have been too many witnesses around so they had to have been on foot to snatch her. At the time of Brenda Sue's abduction, the police did in fact actually have a couple of suspects that they believed could have been behind this murder. The very first suspect the police had at the time was a very weird, unidentified, bald white man 
who apparently actually exposed himself to Brenda Sue and her little sister. That's so disgusting to think about. And remember, they're young kids, and the youngest was six years old. Like, that's what kind of a person just does that? That's so gross. Nine and six. Ew. If anyone ever has any type of sexual feelings towards a young child, I find that so despicable and so disgusting. Like, it's... You have to be a real piece of human garbage to even have feelings towards a child like that. Like, pedophilia and all that. So gross. The second suspect was actually a 13-year-old mentally disabled African-American young man named Robert Roseboro. Like I said, he's 13. The white man had actually been the prime suspect of the case, but when authorities were unable to locate him, they narrowed down on this poor black kid named Robert Roseboro. So when he was ultimately questioned about the murder of Brenda Sue, he actually remained silent about it, which remember he was mentally disabled, so it's possible he didn't understand or comprehend what they were talking about. I'm not speaking on behalf, like I don't know if he was, like any type of things that he had. Maybe there's a saying he was mentally disabled because he was African American and this was back in the 60s. I, I'm just speaking on what I was able to find. So they found out that whenever he remains silent about it, the police became extremely suspicious about Robert. And especially when they found out that he actually lived only a couple yards away from where Brenda Sue's body was actually located. Due to this and his refusal to answer the, any questions about her death, the police believed that he was the prime suspect. When the police, like the public, they found out about this, they were furious because they wanted Robert to be have been questioned further by police. They wanted him to be arrested and charged right then and there with her murder, especially because he was said to have been in the local area around the same time and the same morning of Brenda Sue's disappearance and her murder. And the, so the townspeople of Shelby, North Carolina, they assumed that Robert was ultimately being protected by a local crime mob. And during this t specific time period, the town of Shelby was ran by this mob and they controlled the entire area. And this was said to have been like the same time as the Ku Klux Klan was going on. A police officer at the time believed that, uh, claimed that he believed that Robert Rose, Roseboro was the one who had killed Brenda Sue. The officer named Harold Smith, he stated that they had to let him go because there just was not enough evidence against him to prosecute him for the crime, but he just felt in his gut that it was him, possibly because he was black and this was the 60s. You know, they were just racist everywhere back then. It was ridiculous. So Robert in um, 2005 had a couple of visitors to visit him in the prison that he was staying at to... Uh, talk about Brenda Sue Brown, but he just refused to bring it up. Robert was actually convicted in the May 1969 murder of Mary Helen Williams. And when this occurred, police became extremely intrigued because just of how similar her murder was to Brenda Sue Brown's. At 11.30 a.m. on the morning of June 22nd of 1968, a woman and her young daughter arrived at Mary Helen's business. There was a closed sign in front of her business, which was struck both the females as odd because her store would have been open by then. And, you know, they were just very confused. They were, wanted to see what was going on. So the young daughter decided to glance inside the store and was absolutely horrified to see a young woman just lying in front on the floor of the store in front of the door, just covered in blood. So, obviously, the family, they just called the Shelby, the police department, right away to inform them of what had happened. And once the police arrived there, Robert Roseboro was seen walking out of the business with his hands up in the air. Inside the business was the body of Mary Helen, who was discovered nude, but she had not been assaulted, just like the way that Brenda Sue was. When police searched the store where her body was discovered, they ended up finding Mary Helen's undergarments and her clothes in the restroom of the store. This case was considered to have been connected at the time to the murder of Brenda Sue Brown, but like I said, there wasn't any type of evidence that connect could connect both of them. The police just theorized it was. In 1968, racial segregation and tension were extremely prevalent and intense during the time 
uh, in uh, Shelby, North Carolina. One of the most radical groups about, you know, white supremacy at the time that we, you all know, I'm going to be going about here. So the Ku Klux Klan, they were said to have actually, th like the leaders of the group were said to have actually threatened Robert Roseboro with murder when we, we had just discussed that he's only 13 years old, mentally disabled, probably had no idea what the hell was going on. And police were actually concerned at this point for Robert's safety because they were afraid that the Ku Klux Klan leaders were going to find him and lynch him for a crime that he may or may not have committed. So they ultimately transferred him to a jail that was in another county in the state the following year of 1969. A pathologist starts to examine the blood that was actually found on the clothes that Robert had been wearing and realized that this blood type matched the blood type that Mary... Helen Williams was said to have. He denied any type of involvement in her murder and just kept denying, like, bringing up the fact that he had no motive to kill Mary Helen. He said, why would I want to kill her if I don't really know her? And a lot of people said, you know, because she's white and you're black and it's just... It was just the stupidest reasons. There was no signs of assault to her body. There was no robbery. So what would have been the motive behind killing Mary Helen? If he was to be the one who killed her, why would he have done it? Is basically what he was saying. Robert was then ultimately found guilty of the murder of Mary Helen Williams and was sentenced to death. After a while, they then reduced his sentence from instead of being sentenced to death to life in prison. Which, I mean, I'm a supporter of the death penalty, but I feel like with the death penalty, it's more so you want to make sure you have all the facts, all the evidence, and make sure you have everything lined up that proves that this person was a real piece of shit. And instead of just saying, oh, you know, he's black and he, you know, this is the 60s, he must have killed them, you know? It just, it did not make sense to me at all. Like, they're logic behind him being the one responsible for killing both of these girls. So around the same time it was then rumored that due to the amount of similarities between the deaths of Mary Helen and Brenda Sue, Robert must have been the one behind both of them. So the authorities took him into a court hearing about the case back in 2010 for which he constantly denied killing. Brenda Sue kept claiming he didn't know anything about the case, didn't know her, didn't know what was going on. He just knew that they assumed that he was the one behind it. He was not even told of any details about the case at all. Then, when asked about how he killed her, Robert claimed that he didn't have any memory of that day and does not even recall killing her. I've heard people say it's because they thought that Robert was on drugs and he could have blacked out back then and just, you know, went willy-nilly and killed her, which... He had no signs of drugs or alcohol in his body whenever he had been arrested for the murder back when he was 13 years old. It just, the way that people thought back then just, it confuses the hell out of me because it just, their logic that was not there. They just assumed that, you know, because someone is walking down the street and they're black and a white girl, you know, was snatched and went missing and was killed there, that he had to have been the one to do it. So it, it just, you know, it doesn't make any sense. You guys know what I'm talking about. So they believe that, um, you know, like the uh, family and stuff, they believe that something must have happened and that Robert could not have been responsible. Robert's family, anyways, believe that he could not have been responsible. So... I've heard, like I said, I've heard about the people saying that he could have blacked out because he was on drugs. But many years, they passed by after 1966 and 1968 and everything else. And there are absolutely no leads as to who could have done this to poor Brenda Sue. So in 2005, Brenda Sue's sisters named Patricia and Mary, remember we talked about them earlier, they had spent several months begging to the Shelby Area Police Department to reopen the case and finally figure out who exactly could have been the one to kill Brenda Sue. They believe that it could not have been Robert behind all of it because he just was seemed like he was in the wrong place at the wrong time. You know, it just seemed like everything was pinpointed against him. There was no, you know, evidence supporting that he was the one behind it. So... They arrived at the local police station and they, the sisters informed the police station of what 
they wanted. They wanted the case to be reopened. They wanted to know what happened to their sister. And so this was when officers began to tell the ladies that all the files for Brenda Sue's case had conveniently disappeared and that it would be even more difficult now to solve the case. Like literally, I can only imagine just how furious and like frustrating this could have been. And my theory about that is that maybe possibly they could have been so worked up about wanting to get this Robert Roseboro guy behind it that they just threw out all the evidence and it was like, you know, we don't need this because we know it's him. It just, you know, it baffles me, honestly. <laughs> it really does. So, after four long days of searching for the missing files, they were ultimately located next to the box of evidence regarding the case of Mary Helen Williams. Which, I mean, it, it kind of makes sense because they, they thought the time it was connected, but it just, it was weird. However, despite being located, there were a lot of key items to the case that were missing. These items were actually said to have been Brenda, Brenda Sue's dress that she had been wearing the day that she was murdered, her underwear, her shoes, her powder puff compact, the freaking murder weapon, which was said to have been that rock that was found by her body to cover it in blood, that was completely gone. And there was two vials of blood that had been picked up during her original, like the original time that they found her body and was put into this evidence box, but it all went missing. So, mm. and fingernail scrapings where Brenda Sue had actually fought back were missing as well. Branches and a single hair belonging to Brenda Sue were all just gone. So this really set back the case and it made authorities frustrated, feeling like they wouldn't ever be able to solve the case. According to police records, the last person who had all this evidence was a man named Sheriff Allen. And now the only physical evidence that the police had now was this bloodied hamperin'. I think that maybe it's a possibility that the Sheriff Allen guy believed that Robert Roseboro was the one behind it and they threw out all the evidence because they're like, we don't need this anymore because we know it's Robert, you know? So it's just kind of shows you sometimes like, sometimes like how corrupt, you know, police officers can be and people of the law back during that time. Just they had such narrow minds that they focused in on how they thought that this black boy had killed this little girl, Brenda Sue, that they completely disregarded any evidence. It was just like, you know, fuck it. It's just him. It's him. So I can understand just how, like I said, Brenda Sue's family must have been like so frustrated at this point because they wanted this case to be solved and everything was missing and the Sheriff Island guy is the one who got rid of all of it. He probably destroyed it. We don't even know. So this was an absolute embarrassment to the police police department and Sheriff Allen himself should have been ex absolutely embarrassed and ashamed of himself and just what he did. The bloody palm print was said to have actually been removed from Brenda Sue's shoe back in 1966 when Sheriff Allen was the one in charge of her case. On May 15th of 2006, her body was then exhumed to find any type of evidence and forensic investigators were shocked to find that her casket had completely disintegrated and all that was left were just a few small bones. And it's just, it frustrated them to no belief. Like, the whole family were was upset. They were upset with the fact that the boy that this case was handled. The fact that they kept saying that it was this boy when it could not have been. And it just seemed so frustrating and seemed like they had no end, no resolve to this case. So on May 21st of 2006, her body was ultimately relayed to rest in Sunset Cemetery in Shelby, North Carolina. That same year of 2006, a newspaper in Shelby, North Carolina actually started to write an article about the 40th anniversary of uh, Brenda Sue's murder, just to bring it out all the word out there and spread it around just so that she would not have been forgotten. And this was when a woman named Lori Lail, she came forward to authorities. Lori Lail told them that she had some pretty vital information that was connected to the case and she wanted to talk to them about it. I have no idea honestly why it takes people so long to confess to knowing something about a case. 
You know, I mean, I can understand, like, if they're scared or anything like that, but it's just, it frustrates me because I feel bad for the families. Because there's someone out there who knows something and won't come forward to tell the authorities because they just, you know, they, they get lost in time and, you know, they just don't know to come forward, don't feel like it, they're scared, you know, it just, it all does not make any sense to me. So, like I said, Lori Lale, she came forward to authorities and she claimed to them that her grandfather named Earl Mickey Parker told her that he and another man named Thurman Price had actually abducted and murdered Brenda Sue. Obviously, you know, whenever she was told this, it's this information just shocked Lori Lale because this was her grandfather, someone that she loved, admired, and respected, confessing to her to killing this young girl. So, you know, like I said, he, they saw this guy, this 13-year-old kid, go through all of this, being told that he's guilty and everything, when they're the ones behind it, you know, they just, zip, you know, it's, ugh. so... She went to the police to talk about this, and unfortunately, Earl Mickey Parker, he passed away on June 26th of 2022 before he could ever be charged with her murder. However, at the time, Thurman Price was still alive, and on February 12th of 20, 2007, the police arrested him and presented him with a first-degree murder charge of Brenda Sue. Back in 1966, his home was said to have been really close to where Brenda Sue's body was actually located. And after he was arrested, he was ult ultimately just bailed out of jail right away for a $50,000 bond before just repeatedly denying that he was not involved. He had no idea what was going on, doesn't know this Brenda Sue girl. Earl Mickey Parker told his granddaughter in great detail how he and Thurman Price abducted and killed Brenda Sue. And when uh, Lori Lael, she told Brenda Sue's sister about Thurman Price being involved in her murder, she didn't even mention Earl at all. Back in 1954, Earl Parker, was, who was 26, and Thurman Price, who was 25 at the time, they were charged with the assault of a 12-year-old girl named Shirley Morrison. So they were not, like... They, they were they were um, familiar with this type of crime of, of abusing young girls and they they weren't a stranger to it basically they knew what they were doing if they would have done this to like Brenda Sue then it's a possibility that they would have known what they were doing at that time and killing her so they were then sent to trial and both of them pled guilty to the charges of raping this poor little girl named Shirley Morrison. So, this, what the police came, the uh, courts came up with had me so mad, y'all. Like, I was shaking, shaking, because I was like, how in the world are you, Ugh. So, they were sent to trial, and both of them pled guilty to the charges, and the court told them that instead of being arrested or sent to jail or anything, they both needed to get jobs, and they... Uh, were not to drink alcohol anymore, and they both needed to pay the courts $240 each. Yeah. So I'm not sure if it was just like the time period, you know, like that's how they were. I wasn't alive back then, obviously. But I'm not sure if it was that, or maybe, you know, racism, you know, because, you know, some people, judges, were would uh, go f more f towards, you know, like, the white parties, you know, let them off easy while, like, a black person who could not, like, Robert Roseboro was being charged with a crime he didn't even commit and was being treated like he was a felon. So, it's just, it's absolutely ridiculous to me. After Earl's deathbed confession was announced, police and courts decided to tell uh, um, Lori that what he told her would be used as evidence in the case. So she testified that Earl Mickey Parker had confessed to her that he had killed Brenda Sue in 1966 with Thurman Price. And what I'm about to tell y'all is a quote that was from the interview with um, Lori. So, Earl walked into a local bootlegger's house the night before where he met Thurman Price and drank for several hours. 
While walking home from here the next morning, they saw Brenda Sue Brown near South Lafayette Street and they sneaked up behind her with the intention of assault. Lori had described how Earl Mickey Parker told her that Thurman Price had grabbed Brenda Sue who had screamed and he dragged her from the road where a young black boy was seen playing in the field. Earl screamed after him to get on home and just used a lot of racial slurs. So this supposedly was actually the young boy named Robert Rosebro who was the one accused of murdering Brenda Sue. It's kind of weird how that lines up. According to Lori Lale's grandfather's account, Brenda Sue had fought back hard against her uh, attackers and scratched Thurman Price, which infuriated him, and he ended up picking up a huge rock and hit her in the face just over and over and over again. And ultimately, he confessed to Earl Parker, you know, we need to kill her because, this was quoted, they would have to go away to jail for real this time. So basically, they killed her because they didn't want to get in trouble for raping her. Y'all. Y'all. I can't. I can't. Like, that's just the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard of. That's the most bizarre reason to kill someone. You know, you're assaulting her and you kill someone with a rock, a small child, because you don't want to go to jail for what you just did to her. Like, what in the world is wrong with people? The murder of Brenda Sue Brown appeared on various true crime television, sh television shows, which most notably appeared on an episode of Captured, which premiered on the Oxygen Channel on November 11th, 2007. I love the Oxygen Channel. Love it, love it, love it. I don't have cable though. We have a Roku TV, so I'm just like nyo, 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 on YouTube trying to find some stuff, but I absolutely love the Oxygen Channel. <laughs> So I personally would love to see more people cover this case and get the word out about Brenda Sue and just talk about more. Because like I said, I had never actually even heard about this case until I came upon it on Google. And I was like, oh, you know, and I looked into it, beep, bop, boop. And it was just so frustrating, so heartbreaking what had happened to her. And it's just, ugh, there needs to be more people out there talking about this case, talking about what had happened to her get it out there and just talk about how just disgustingly racist that time period was to accuse this poor 13 year old developmentally disabled black boy of killing this girl and he had no idea what in the world they were talking about but he ended up being treated like a criminal for literally no reason and the fact of the matter is that these people actually had killed her and they didn't tell anybody and they just lived their lives. Watched this poor guy get treated like crap and be accused of a murder that they had committed. You know, it just, it blows my mind just how ridiculous people were back then and still are today. There's a lot of monsters out there in the world. So thank you guys so much for listening to my video today and talk listening about what had happened to poor Brenda Sue Brown you know it's just such a heartbreaking case it really is it's so frustrating too it got me so worked up and so mad and you know I would love to know what you guys think about this case do you guys think that you know justice was served and do you guys think that you know it's great that they found the people but you know, it is great actually that they found who had been behind it, but the only problem was is that whenever I researched it, beep, bop, boop, you know, in 2012, I believe it was 2012, the guy that was still alive, Thurman Price, was said to have died in prison before his trial even started. So it's just, it, it blew my mind. Was it Thurman Price or was it Ear Earl? Well, whichever, the, the one that was still alive at the time, you know, he passed away before he could ever go to trial for this case. This was back in, he died, I think, in 2012, 2013. And I was so frustrated when I found out about this. I'm like, oh my god, now he's never going to, you know, get the um, prison sentence that he deserves. He's not going to get in trouble for this. But yeah, I, I personally, I believe in God. I believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. And I know that he has... You know, a way to give out punishment for those who do deserve it. And, you know, that is my thoughts and my opinion. So, like I said, thank you guys so much for listening to what happened to poor Brenda Sue. And 
Uh, let me know down below if you guys want me to cover any other type of cases. You know, I just love seeing what you guys want me to cover. And I will see you guys in my next Tuesday video. Goodbye, guys.